Thank you. Morena Fana. Fano, am I close? Please tell me I'm close. Morena Fano. Good to be here. Good to be here. Yes, uh, Pastor Eddie Tupai asked me to join you a few years ago, and what I found by visiting Tui Ridge is that we're in the most beautiful place close to nowhere. And there's something beautiful about that autonomy being nowhere out here. Such beautiful land, such beautiful people. What I learned a couple of years ago was that I was the one blessed by being with you all. You need to know that. You need to know when we come to serve in other spaces and places, you are actually impacting us in beautiful ways. When I left your gathering that Sunday morning, someone, and maybe she's here this morning, took the national green stone off of her neck and placed it around mine and gave me kisses and sent me on my journey. And more than once, more than once, and more than once a month, this gem comes out of my bags and I wear it around our community in La Sierra. So you do shape people from all around the world. I come to you from Southern California, so let me say a word about that. My husband was going to travel with me. He's a lecturer, um, a professor with the School of Medicine at Loma Linda, and it turns out the semester begins on Monday. It's not a great time to travel. The students arrive. So we, I bring you greetings from him. We have two young adult daughters who are launched out in the world with big ideas and kind of millennial appetites, and it's wonderful. We moved to California a couple of decades ago, and my father gave us the counsel because my mother and father had lived in Loma Linda for their career, for their education. My father, you see, I'm from the Pacific Northwest in the States. That's kind of God's country for us. It's equivalent to this place here. So I'm from Oregon, and my father told us when we moved to Southern California, I have one thing to say to you, get in and get out. Get in and get out, because all the bad is held up in California. My father said it's like one foot is slip in hell and the other is slipping in. He was quite serious. And so here we are 30 years later still in Southern California. We have learned that California needs missionaries. And we are quite at home there. So, may I get to the point? Permission to speak honest with you. Our time together is short. And let's not waste it, yes? Let's not waste it. If 2020 vision is the, the goal and the thought this week, I want to ask this morning about shame and guilt and Jesus. Shame and guilt and Jesus. Because my idea, my, curious, my curiosity is that what if shame and guilt are somehow blurring our vision for Jesus? I want to think about that with you this morning for a few minutes. Guilt. Now, it might mean different things to different people in the world. Guilty pleasures. That's a phrase we use at home. I don't know if you use it here uh, in the North Island. Guilty pleasures. It's when we, we enjoy something a little bit too much, and then we feel bad afterwards. Let me introduce you to some of our church members at La Sierra in this very short video. We ask them, what are your guilty pleasures? What is the thing you do you enjoy a little bit too much and you feel guilty afterwards and you sure hope no one finds out? L listen. My guilty pleasure um, is making and eating large amounts of pizza. Uh, I was gifted a uh, pizza steel last year for Christmas. And ever since then, it's just been downhill. Uh, it's an obsession, it's an addiction. I need help. Please help. My guilty pleasure is coffee and chocolate. My guilty pleasure is sitting in my bathroom in the morning doing online crossword puzzles and drinking my mug of coffee. My guilty pleasure is cooking. My guilty pleasure is potatoes in any way, shape, or form I can get them. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner be fine with me. My guilty pleasure is Gossip Girl. I love watching Gossip Girl and eating pasta or popcorn or anything, and I could watch it all day. I like to sneak away with my husband on his trips and leave those children behind. My guilty pleasure is binging The West Wing on Netflix. BMW enthusiast, 
and my guilty pleasure is enjoying the Porsche experience. Well, my guilty pleasure is candy, probably licorice, which is probably not the best. My guilty pleasure is consuming too much caffeine in all kinds of great, flavorful, delicious coffee drinks. My guilty pleasure is Mexican candy. I gotta say that spicy, sweet, bitter, sour, salty combination is it, just is to die for it. My guilty pleasure is sitting down with a big bowl of salty popcorn and eating the whole thing by myself. My guilty pleasure is watching movies. My guilty pleasure is getting massages. And as you can see, I'm at it massage place right now. Es ist die dritte Tasse Kaffee. My guilty pleasure is ice cream. My guilty pleasure is Pop-Tarts. With popcorn, peanut butter pretzels, and ice cream. Organic ice cream. Tastes good. I feel very guilty every time I give in and have a Dr. Pepper. My guilty pleasure is, I think it's Facebook. My guilty pleasure is arguing with people on Facebook. My name is Peter Kress, and my guilty pleasure is sweetened breakfast cereals. We never had the sweetened breakfast cereals in the house when I was growing up, but once a year we'd go to camp meeting, and my mom would always pack the single serving boxes. So once a year we got to have Fruit Loops or Frosted Flakes or Lucky Charms. Now, as an adult, I don't eat those at home, but when I go on a road trip, I make sure I'm well supplied. My guilty pleasure is watching Dr. Pimple Popper on YouTube. My guilty pleasure is, along with my healthy fats that I have every day, dark chocolate. But it has to be dark. Chocolate. Chocolate. Stuck me. White chocolate. Mon péché mignon, c'est le chocolat. Chocolate ice cream. My guilty pleasure is chocolate chips. I've been told this is my guilty pleasure, although I don't really feel guilty about it. <laughs> right? If it turns out, uh, we usually only feel guilty when someone else discovers what it is we're doing, yeah? It could be that when I say guilt and the word shame, that we're thinking a variety of things here across the room this morning. We learn these ideas, guilt and shame, usually in our homes and in the communities that shape us. So show me the community that raised you. Show me the culture that raised you. Show me the language that raised you. Show me the home that raised you. Show me the religion that raised you. Show me the rituals that raised you, and we can begin to talk about why you have ideas of guilt and shame that look one way and why I might have them that look another way. We learn this usually starting at home. What's the table that raised you? Here's a picture of the table that raised me. These are Northern Europeans and take them in in all of their happiness. I mean, they're not really uh, overdosed on joy, are they? A little bit strict. A little bit proper, uh, a little bit, yeah, all of your Pacifica warmth hugs, kissing, no, that's not this family, right? My grandmother on the left uh, is the one that brought Christianity and Seventh-day Adventism to my father's home. My grandmother, when we were little, would pray her proper prayers in a loud voice so we could all hear them. Oh, dear God, I pray for my grandsons. Their hair is too long. And my granddaughters, their dresses are too short. Oh, fit them. You know this phrase, fit them for the kingdom, if it's even possible. That was my grandmother praying for all of us. Now, let me say a note here. Born and raised Seventh-day Adventist, it turns out that uh, I was adopted into this family. And so this week I intend to speak very honestly about our tradition because I know it well and it's my life. 
and I expect I will be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist faith community until Jesus takes us home. And I also realized I would not be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian if it wasn't for the home that shaped me. It turns out when I was born, the parents couldn't keep me. They needed to give me up for adoption. They rang up a sanitarium. That sounds familiar to you. I was dropped off at the Portland Sanitarium in Portland, Oregon, and this family took me home. Right? We don't know the whole story there, but something about that birth mother thought, my child will be safe with the Adventists. So we celebrate that. And then we can also speak honestly. Show me the table that raised you and we can begin to talk about your ideas of shame and guilt. It turns out we learn these. And we learn these in our homes of origin. So when I say shame or when I say guilt, I wonder what you're thinking. It's the subject of our psalm this morning from Psalm 51 and the song so beautifully sung by Neville earlier. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside of me. We don't have to read the remainder of the psalm, the before or the after. You know this psalm. We know this verse, it turns out. Probably the specialists, the Christian historians tell us this psalm is more well-known and more recited than any other psalm in the Bible. Maybe not where you grew up or where I grew up, but in Catholicism and in Protestantism alike around the globe, Psalm 51 is a regular prayer. It's a regular prayer during the holy days when you come for Lent. It's a regular, or, or when you come uh, during Passion Week, it's a regular prayer of confession. It's a regular prayer that is sung as a hymn. In some traditions, it's sung at the end of communion every single time, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 has more traction then than many psalms in our history. And it turns out it matters the words that we sing and the words that we say. These are words that are in our head and they shape us and they form us and they create in us ideas. Create in me a clean heart. That's the part of the psalm everybody knows. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Put a, a renewed, right spirit within you. When you read this psalm, though, however, all of the verses together, let me continue on uh, past verse, uh, back up to verse 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. The idea is that this psalm, the thinking is this psalm was written while Israel is in Babylon, while they are slaves, and over and over and over again, we'll find the word for forgive me, please God, now. That there's, uh, the, the, word, the word variety is used over and over again. Six different expressions. Have mercy, wash me clean, purge me, rinse me, uh, hide, my, hide your face from me. Again and again, the psalmist says, God, do your God thing now. I need you to show up and be God now. Also with the word for, uh, for sin, sin, iniquity, evil. It's used 11 different times in this psalm. The prayer is preoccupied with what has happened in the past. The prayer and the psalmist and the lyricist is absolutely committed to one thing. We're going to tell the truth right now. Things happened in my past, and we don't want the past to become our future. So God, do a thing right now. This is Psalm 51. It's not, by the way, a quiet prayer or a silent prayer. This is a prayer spoken with a full voice. Now, the authors say lots of things about these 19 verses, but, but mostly that we could summarize Psalm 51 with three words, I have sinned. That's Psalm 51, I have sinned, and it's the cry of a broken heart. I like the author who says, actually, Psalm 51 is like shoving a kid under a cold shower. Did you have a cold shower this morning? Some of us? Imagine that visual. It's like shoving a kid under a cold shower and waiting until a cry emerges from their soul. That's Psalm 51. 
a, a person crying out for God to show up and be God, there are some tremendously helpful things about this psalm. I want to name two. There is something going face to face with God. Do you notice this too? There is something going face to face with God and telling the truth. This psalm is used that way in worship. Imagine we've come uh, to synagogue worship today and you've all come down the center aisle and you've brought with you your sacrifices. And this is specifically because we're going to cry out Psalm 51. Oh, not one at a time, but we're all going to cry it out together. The whole congregation is going to cry this. There's something beautiful about that. We all come in with our sacrifices and we bring them to the altar and they are burned for this very reason. There's a ritual that happens. This isn't silent. This is no eyes to the left or to the right. Did you see in the video the guilty people? They're kind of looking left and looking right. There's none of that because everyone's sitting in a congregation together telling the truth. There's something beautiful about this. God, we're crying out for you to be God right now. We don't want our past to become our future again. There are some of you in some of your cultures who understand this, Samoan and Tongan culture and some of the Pacific cult, Pacifica cultures where you, you have, go through rituals and sit, sit and keep watch until forgiveness happens. That's Psalm 51, and it's beautiful. There's also something that concerns me uh, in this psalm. Something, oh, oh, pardon me. Let me name the other idea that I think is helpful. One, the first there's something beautiful about going face to face with God. Two, there's something about doing it together. No one's whispering. No one's pointing. It's all of us together. The eyes in this psalm are actually plural. It's we. When we read the psalm and you see the word I, we should think we, we all create in us, each of us right now, a clean heart. Oh God. This is beautiful to imagine doing all of this together. If you read the subscript at the beginning of the psalm, the author tells us, this is for the music leader. This is for you, Jason. A song you could sing about that time, David, when the prophet came to David after he had been with Bathsheba. We know that time, right, church? We know that time when, when the king spied a woman doing what most people do, take a bath, and wanted her for his own. This is a psalm for that time. The thought is that this psalm has been through many edits and adaptations and adjustments and maybe even proscripts here. Point being, when the nation gathers, they can remember a time when something happened and when King David had a problem, it's not personal. There is no such thing in the Old Testament, the Old Testament of our Bible, as individual sins. They're all communal. When David has... When David slips, when David sins with Bathsheba, it becomes a community sin. It affects all of the families. So it is in worship that they cry out for all of them to have a healing. It's beautiful. Here's the part of the psalm that gives me caution in verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5. Yes, I was born in guilt, in sin, the psalmist says, from the moment my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, verse 5. This particular verse, sin as a biological inheritance or guilt, this is in the Christian tradition where our ideas of guilt and shame are kind, they wed, and we inherited this idea that there must be something wrong and bad about our bodies, that there must be something wrong and bad about intimacy, that it is in the very act of procreation that sin is happening. These are old ideas in the Christian tradition. They were thinking of guilt so guilty that all we could think to do was when children were born to hurry up and baptize them so they wouldn't be destined for hell. Friends, this is our tradition. And I won't fully address this this morning before lunch. It's a big topic before lunch. But actually on Thursday morning, on Thursday morning, the talk that morning picks up where this leaves off. Let me say a couple more things. 
I don't think that the psalmist is giving witness to original sin. I don't think the psalmist is talking about ideas that theologians and thinkers and historians worked on much, much later. I think the psalmist is bearing witness. Humans are complex people, and humans make mistakes again and again and again. And when we make mistakes, it disrupts community. It disrupts our families. It disrupts my life and your life. I think the psalmist is saying, We have a problem being humans, but hear me carefully now. There's a difference between saying we are born into a predicament and saying we are the predicament. I don't believe the psalmist is saying humans are the predicament. Why do I have that idea? We have to read the rest of the testimony of Scripture, and I take my cue from Harold Kushner, Rabbi Kushner, in his book, How Good Do We Have to Be? This is a book many Adventist Christians would resonate with. If you haven't read it already, pick it up. How good do I have to be? Kushner asks this question, and he revisits, he goes back and revisits the story of Genesis and says, you know, it seems that the way we tell our story from the beginning is what matters here. We have more than one way, but let me name two ways this morning of the way we tell the beginning of our story with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is a catacomb from Rome about 300 AD. So, you know, 250, 300 years after Jesus when ideas are already starting to be formed about what all of this story means and we draw pictures of ways of understanding the story. One way of talking about our story is to think of this as a story of misbehavior and punishment in God's world. That when God put us in the Garden of Eden and gave us an instruction that if we broke that rule, that forevermore we would be banished from God's love. The human story is actually a story of misbehavior and punishment. The human story is actually a story of humans who can never quite get it right. The human story is a story of people who are always at odds with their God. And these bad decisions mean we will be separated from God's love one day. Kushner asks us to be very careful when we tell this story. It's almost like we can fall in and out of salvation daily, friends. And if you haven't been in a home like that, it's happening. We have homes where children are, every time a foul word is said or a bad activity happens, they fall to their knees and they confess because God might not save them in heaven. This is what we're talking about this morning. Kushner says that's because we've sometimes told our story that the human story is a story of misbehavior and punishment. And what is it, Kushner says, about humans that we like to define ourselves by our worst moments? Think about that. He tells a story in his book of a spelling bee when he was a little boy. He was a contestant in a spelling bee, and the word came up. He stepped forward to spell the word. He could not spell the word, and he's dismissed. And forevermore, the message he has told himself is, I'm a bad speller. I mean, what can I say? I'm just not a good speller. And he can be 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and have graduate degrees, and still the message in his head is, I'm a bad speller. We had one little tiny faux pas with the media this morning, and those of us in church work know, oh, that's all anybody remembers, that the words weren't up for that song. Oh, that was a mess. That was a train wreck. Yeah, we didn't get that one chorus. Who are those people back there running those machines? Why can't we go to a church where they know when to hit advance? Come on. We forget that 55 minutes of the service worked magically. (laughs) And we had 15 seconds of oops. Oops. Why is it, Kushner says, we like to define ourselves by our worst moments? There is more than one way to tell this story, he says. Be very careful when we tell the story this way. This is not actually a statement about us. This is a statement about God. This is a statement about a God who has conditional love and conditional forgiveness. Think very carefully about telling our story this way, as if God's forgiveness and love cannot handle human catastrophe. The other way to tell the story, we are humans, complex humans in God's world. When you go to the beginning of the story and we read again in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and when the the creatures, Adam and Eve, when they pulled from the tree and ate where they were not to be, 
Remember the voice coming to them? What was it that voice said, church? Did the voice say, what are you doing? Did the voice say, you're such a fool? Did the voice say, get your, get your hand off my tree. Stop breaking things in my story. Did God say any of that? God said, where are you? Who told you you were naked? What's the voice in your head? Why are you naked and ashamed right now? That's not the relationship we have. Who put that idea in your head? Kushner says we need to all be accountable for the way we tell our story. Ours is a story of complexity and wonder and pain and potential. And yes, we are capable of cruelty and deceit and harm. We are all witnesses here this morning. And what do we do with that? I also take some help from Brene Brown, the social scientist from my country, who says, shame says I am bad. I am the predicament. Guilt said, I did something bad, born into a predicament. Hear the difference? Shame says, I am bad. And shame is the thing I walk around with in my skin now, and I cower, and I keep my head down, and I feel embarrassed, or I don't go out, or I worry and have anxiety, and I have internal voices in my head. We oftentimes get these voices from inside our faith tradition. And what if this clogs our vision so we can't actually see Jesus? Shame. Let me say a word more. I have this doll that came with me on this trip. She's traveled a few places in the world. I don't know if I brought her to Spirit Led. Uh, isn't, isn't she lovely? <laughs> isn't, she's got little britches on that I made out of a sock after all of her clothes fell off. She has a little place in the back here where you would wind her up and she would sing and make music. It's a little creepy now, the teenagers tell me. That's a scary little face. Her hair is all gone and her clothes are all gone and everything about her is over. Simply doesn't matter if you're a kid with a favorite toy. It's yours, right? I didn't know there was anything wrong with this doll until one day in a group of kids, someone said, ooh, what's, ooh, what is that? I'm like, it's baby, it's baby. Oh, she's so disgusting. Oh, that, oh, I didn't know. Oh, and that's how shame begins. The specialists tell us that children can hear the voice of shame maybe as early as age two and three, certainly by age four, five, and six. And we may be uh, 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 unknowing. We certainly aren't intentional trying to make our children and grandchildren feel shame. Shame is the voice that says, I'm bad, there's something bad about me if I like a doll like that. Years ago, I came outside of the church and found a poster, a handmade poster, hanging on the power pole. It was a picture of a girl, her face, maybe she's age 10 or 11, and she's handwritten a note underneath it and she's taped it on the post so we would all see it coming and going on Sabbath morning. It simply said, I was a little girl who grew up in this church. This church is where I learned my family was poor. This church is where I learned I didn't belong. This church, well, that's shame. Those are the voices of shame. There is a difference between guilt and shame. What I'm suggesting this morning, that guilt, I did something bad, can be very useful. Guilt, I did something bad, is that consciousness, consciousness the Spirit gives us that says, I behaved in a way, I made a choice that caused harm. I talked to a person the way we are not supposed to talk to people. I wasn't able to keep my commitment in this friendship. I wasn't able to do my part at home and my family, my family paid the price. Guilt can be our teacher. Guilt can be useful. And according to the psalmist, when guilt is useful to us like that, give me just a second. When guilt is useful to us just like that, then we bring it to God and we release it. We don't hold it up and walk around with it forever and ever and ever. 
That's what the psalm is for. So friends, guilt can be useful to us, but shame does not belong in our story. I want to say that so clearly this morning. Shame needs to go now. And it could be that shame is clogging our vision so that we cannot even see Jesus. It could be that we're so full of ourself, we can't even get God in the middle of God's story. Do you understand what I mean? My father grew up his whole life feeling inferior and pro like he was the problem in the world. When you walk around with those tapes in your head, it's very hard for God to be the center of God's story. The little song that I sang growing up in Sabbath school, Oh, be careful, little... Oh, you know it too. Did you learn it here? In the island? New Zealand? Australia? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little... There's a father up above, and he's down in love. So be careful, little... Because there's a father looking down in love. <clears throat> it matters what we sing. These lyrics get traction in our head. That's probably a song we don't need to sing anymore. In our faith community, we've actually gone through all the music in the children's rooms, in the teen rooms, in the sanctuary, and we've asked ourselves this question. If you want a clearer vision of Jesus and God, do the lyrics in this music resemble the Jesus and God of Scripture? If they don't, we won't sing them anymore. Oh, be careful. Guilt can be our teacher. Shame does not belong. The alternative to shame, Brene Brown says, is to make space for the pain in our lives. To sit and feel the pain, to ask ourselves these questions, and then to ask what can we learn from these moments so that our lives will not be dominated by shame and guilt. There is something practical we do with guilt. We interrogate it, we learn from it, we make confession, we say, I'm sorry, we learn and we move on. I suggest to you today that the Adventist church could get rid of shame completely from our homes and our stories and our churches and our schools and only you know what that will look like in your home and in the table that raised you. Only you will know what your culture has taught you about shaming people and the way that that happens. Only you and your family know best practices forward with the help of the Holy Spirit. But I believe it's such a thing that you could walk out the door and say today, we will no longer shame. We are done now. And then... You pray the prayer of Psalm 51. Last night, your lead pastor, Ben, said, Friends, God is busy uh, shaping us and forming us and growing us. I will make you, not only fishers of men, but I will make you. This is what happens when we confess God is making us. The beautiful thing in Psalm 51 is there's bookends in verse 1 and verse 9 with this confession, right? God, please remember my sin no more. And, and the psalmist says his thing, and the bookend happens, and God remembers the sin no more. There is no rehearsing again and again and again. We can drop the family stories of the time that father did that or grandmother did the other. We can drop the church stories of the time the teenagers, da, 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 da. We can drop all of it. Because once Psalm 51 happens, God draws a line on it, and the future is bright. So it is, we'll close this morning reading Psalm 51 together in a modern translation church. No eyes to the left, no eyes to the right, because this is about all of us. The confession happens when we read it aloud together. Have mercy on me, God. According to your faithful love, wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean from my guilt. Purify me from sin because I know my wrongdoings. My sin is always right in front of me.
I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you're justified when you render your verdict completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in sin and guilt from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret space. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit inside me. And the Lord God of heavens, the King of kings, we will now sing about, declares us all clean. Amen. <laughs>